I'm Rob Taylor, uh, and I've been building commercial systems with Linux since the late 90s. Uh, a decade ago, I founded my first open source uh, services, software services, and consultancy business that was called Collabora. Um, and they're still going very strong and now hooked up uh, providing a lot of services around LibreOffice. Uh, seven years ago, I started a, another open source services company called CodeThink, which is based in, in central Manchester. Uh, and as part of that, I've delivered service, open source services to automotive, to finance, to silicon vendors, to um, medical device manufacturers. Uh, so quite a broad range of, of, of market applications. Um, and I started out, so the, the kind of, the, 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 the kickoff for me was uh, a, a, an email from a guy at Nokia, and if uh, anyone remembers, there was a period when Nokia was attempting to build phones out of open source software. Some might say they were a little ahead of the curve. I, uh, had a, I was visiting uh, an old colleague from those days over in uh, Silicon Valley recently, we, and he had one. And I have to say, it still compares very well today <laughs> to, to current offerings. So. Um, but yeah, so, 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 so it was my 10 years of an, 10 year anniversary of doing open source software uh, business. Um, does anyone know any other anniversaries we've had recently that are relevant? Free Software Foundation. So 32 years ago yesterday, um, uh, a guy called Richard Stallman announced a new Unix implementation uh, that he was going to call GNU. And uh, 17 years ago yesterday is, uh, is uh, Google's anniversary. So both relatively relevant in this space. Uh, obviously, we wouldn't be here probably in the same way if uh, Stallman hadn't started, hadn't written that mail 32 years ago. And um, maybe the shape of the internet wouldn't be quite the same. And the, the usage of open source tools wouldn't be quite the same if, uh, if uh, things had happened differently with Google. So back, it's back when I first started building stuff with, with Linux, it was purely pragmatic. The, um, you know, I was working for a company that was trying to engineer a whole, a whole operating system themselves for a product. You know, it wasn't the core offering, they just needed it. Uh, and I said, well, you know, I know a bit about this Linux stuff. I was a bright young thing out of university. Uh, and figure out how these licensing systems, how licensing works, let's try and use that. Uh, and then I, so I became the Linux expert at that organization and uh, built you know, some pretty cutting edge pieces of technology uh, out of Debian, mostly. Um, of course, discussing things in those early days, you had a lot of people laugh at you. Uh, yeah, there was some, I remember, um, I don't know if anyone remembers, Linux is communism, so Microsoft. Uh, Steve Ballmer shouting about how uh, how we're going to ruin the software world. I think in some ways, we maybe we did. Um, everyone used to think we were all bearded, sandaled hippies, a la, a la uh, the great Richard. Um, you know, uh, and, and and regularly, regularly, I'd hit people going, "How can you make a business out of this? How you know? Why would anyone pay for software they can get for free? You know, what was the business model?" Um, and a lot of people thought it would always, and this, you still kind of hit this a bit, even these days. People, there was, people thought that it was a toy for hobbyists, and open source was a toy for hobbyists, and there's still kind of a hint of that floating around. Um, no, we believed, but I mean, there was the, the energy was, it's, I mean, it's, it's still there, but uh, more corralled now, but. In those early days, it was kind of like a frothing of, of energy, of creativity, uh, and a very, very belief-driven engineering. Um, you know, I remember we believed that uh, the work we were doing would greatly help the developing world, and I think that, that's actually panned out, um, and was fundamental to the freedoms of technology that, so with technology become a more and more a basis of our lives, which has definitely panned out over the last last 20 years, um, that 
freedoms in those technologies would be fundamental to maintaining our liberty in the real world. And I think that discussion is still something that's, tr that's still tracking through. And that it would globally unlock creativity and collaboration. Um, and I think that's pan that, that definitely has panned out. Um, the rate of creation of software now is much greater than I think it's, uh, it's ever been. Uh, and you know, the, some of those things came together in, there was a company called, formed called Canonical, which had a product called Ubuntu. That was about the same time as I found it, Collabora. And you know, they, they, they've kind of probably segated off slightly now from that original worldview, but I think there was a, a lot of belief harnessed in those days, which created a lot of value. Um, one of the things that I somewhat remember. Uh, so it's, 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 it's one thing that's been addressed, I think, now. But it, we had, in the UK, a great amount of early capability in open source. I mean, some of the leading lights of open source were British. Um, but as a, as a country, we pretty much ignored it, both on a business level and on a governmental level. I remember, I mean, we're talking at the same time as, as you know, the, the, you know, it's the, the, the internet is taking off and open source software is the foundation of it. At the very same time, we're, uh, we were, um, you know, driving Microsoft into schools and teaching children that using, that being a, Using computers was using Word and writing things in Access. Uh, I'm glad to very, very much glad to see the the uh, change that's happened with the Raspberry Pi and and the BBC Microbit that's coming out now, um, bringing it back to that you, we we should never have our youth depend on a proprietary technology because it's not going to be there when they're older. So, you know, I remember Mark Taylor, uh, who maybe some people in this room remember, heavily lobbying, lobbying the government uh, at that time, um, getting, getting them to, and there's some success, like the, the, that we had to use open documentation standards, though I still hit government departments that still haven't got the memo. Um, I was uh, filling in a smart application grant and had to use um, uh, Excel to fill in one of the sheets. That was brilliant. And so at the same time we were doing this, you know, the internet was growing. The uh, uh, Google was starting, eBay was starting, Amazon was starting. The most of the internet was being run on open source software one form or another. NCSA, HDBD in the early days, becoming Apache, both the dominant uh, web server on the internet. Uh, and of course, we had Netscape, which became um, became Firefox and when that was opened, when, when Netscape floated, we were sold to AOL. Um, and so, nope, got a little child in the room. Um, yeah, so I, I, think, I think there was, there was, yeah, as I say, there was, there was a lead lost in the UK at that time. Um, but in Europe, there were, there were movements happening. I mean, so my, my, uh, my, my, my foot in the door here was started from an email from a guy at Nokia. I'd been working on open source projects to do voice and video over the internet with a component called GStreamer. And you know, I got an email from a guy called Yannick Pelle, uh, who's since you know, lead R and head CTO of Linux for, for Samsung and has now moved on to even bigger and better things. Um, saying, I hear you're the guy to talk about this. I mean, he talked to one of his contractors that was working in this area, and they said, that, that guy out there on the internet, go, go and ask him about this problem. And so I start, so me and uh, uh, Rob McQueen um, put together some plans to, to help solve Nokia's problems on this, and you know, that, that founded a, a company that's still going to this day. Um, and it took a long time. So, so, so one of the things that 
gradually is becoming true is organizations starting to uh, uh, understanding open source and being able to utilize open source as an organization. And to a certain degree, when you're a product organization, that has to start with your legal team. Well, it has to start, it has to start with, your, with your CXO team or your, you know, your head of product for a particular area. Um, but your legal team becomes really, really important in that. And I remember it took about four years for Nokia's legal team to be able to just sign off on using a piece of open source software in a product and eventually developed a really deep and uh, a nuanced understanding of, of the area and uh, we had you know, pretty comprehensive uh, patent uh, reviews with respect to licenses and we knew which every, how every single bit of the, which license applied to which part and which, which licenses we need to worry about patent exposure with. Um, and that was, uh, uh, yeah, so there was a great deal of capability there, which unfortunately got, uh, got lost. I mean, there was a lot of fight back in as, thing, as open source started to become more popular and used more. Um, you know, uh, obviously we had multiple attacks from, from Microsoft uh, trying to, you know, take it out at both uh, organizational level, uh, organizational purchasing levels and uh, governmental purchasing levels. Um, we had was th examples like the, uh, the one, the, one of the projects I worked on was one laptop per child, um, which, which was, which was a, a lovely product. I still, I still have one and, and my, my two year old son uses it. And I kind of hits it. Um, uh, and that, that was, that was, a, that was a, for those that don't know, is that, is that, who's heard of one laptop per child? in the room, I think it's about half the room, that's great. So, so that was a project uh, um, from uh, MIT, that started out of MIT, uh, to build a laptop that under $100, which at those times was, a, was an amazing thing. N nowadays it's kind of pretty, <laughs> kind of anyone can do it, um, to use for, for the developing world to use, uh, as they were especially going and talking to governments and supply and educational sectors of, of the developing world. Um, and, uh, and I remember Intel and Microsoft getting together, making something called the Intel Classmate, which didn't do half of the things or had half of the infrastructural thinking behind it, when they have any of the infrastructural thinking behind it, the OLPC, and going in and just going, we'll give you these. Yeah. Just taking you out you know, in a way that you can't really fight back on. Um, software patents. So this is kind of almost a solved problem now, really, um, so especially in Europe and, and in the UK, but that was a massive fight point. Um, there were, so there were a lot of patents that basically applied to software that were accepted by the, by the, human, by the uh, European Patent Office. And there was a, a you know, there was a, a, a very concrete move to, enshrine software patents in European patent law. And, and that was a massive fight to, to stop that happening. Because when it comes to collaborative development, patents affect, most of the time, patents have a cooling effect on that development and stop things from happening. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's a line that gets, there's a standard law party line that patents are there to increase innovation, increase value in society. But when you get to the level of collaborative development, uh, and modern technology speed actually acts, acts as a cooling effect. And, and that was a big, a big fight to tell that story to, to the European um, agencies and, and, and get that, and get it to the point where we no longer have software patents in, the UK, in, in Europe and the UK, allowing this, a lot of what we're doing today. Um, other examples, I remember there was uh, some Munich was very early uh, deployed open source software across all its, uh, its civil infrastructure, including using uh, OpenOffice on the uh, on the desktop and, and KDE, I believe it was on the desktops. Um, and, and yes, there was a lot of lot of, lot, lot of interesting manoeuvring from uh, from the incumbent supplier, shall we say? Um, of course, I mean this sounds a bit like moaning now because we kind of we won. In a way, you know, I heard last week Microsoft is now running most of its infrastructure on Linux, and it's happy to. And in this, uh, 
going to be supplying us a Linux distribution. Um, quite, quite, quite a turnaround from bearded communists with sand wear sandaled wearing communist hippies. Um, and you know, I, I I regularly interact with massive organisations uh, aiming to provide open source services and supply services uh, around open source components, um, and generally using open source as a way to get to customers. Uh, obviously, I mean, I don't need to tell you, you know, phones, Android is mostly open source, of, there's, there's some interesting angles on that. Uh, also, also Android's almost like the hack of open source, but I'll save that one for another day. Um, but obviously Android on all the phones, even people using Apple's, it, there's a vast amount of open source software running on those systems. Uh, and you know, Apple wouldn't be, an OS X laptop or an iOS phone wouldn't be capable of, of thing. It wouldn't be, wouldn't be in existence without using open source software. Um, and of course, in my work, I see, you know, uh, cars running Linux systems. I see banks running massive amounts of, and, uh, and other financial institutions running massive amounts of infrastructure on, on open source systems. Um, and you see a lot of corporate infrastructure. And of course, you know, the, the moves around IoT are all going to be based on an open source platform of some description. There's massive fights going on, and whose open source platform will win, and we'll see. But um, I think that's uh, going to be somewhat inevitable. And of course, the vast, vast majority of the internet is running on open source software. So, yeah, so, so, so we won, didn't, didn't we? I mean, so I see some of the things from those early days that didn't quite track through. And one of them, I think, is Liberty. Um, and go back to Android. I mean, it's still fundamentally controlled by one organization, even though it's the most, one of the most ubiquitous expressions of open source as a product you can buy. Um, the, the, if you look at things like the Linux Foundation, which is there to support open source software, a lot of it's a, a lot of the angles of approach it takes are heavily dictated by very large organizations who supply these organizers, uh, who you know, supply it. its, its money. Um, and so it becomes harder for smaller players to, to act against the will of larger players in this space. Um, and and well, yeah, one of the kind of interesting things that's happened in, in recent terms is, uh, is the large, organisa large organizations have learned you can buy open source. You can buy, or you can buy the creation, you can buy open source by hiring the main creators. Because in most projects, there is a very small number of core people that create the vast majority of that value. And you can hire them and say, yeah, you work on that project. Um, give them a good salary. You've then got a control point in that whole ecosystem, and you know I think Intel, one of the earlier large organisations, to realise the value of this play. Uh, Samsung have done it too. Uh, I'm not saying this is necessarily a bad thing, but it's definitely uh, potentially a lack of liberty in the space. Um, and of course, on the internet, we have a lot of centralisation. So I think some of the a lot of the people who were there in the early days are now starting, you know, very much concerned about that we we don't actually have control of the software that runs our lives because it's running inside Facebook and it's running inside Google and it's running all these these large data centers which we don't have access to. We don't know what it's going to, what it's doing with our information. We don't know what it's doing with our personalities, our expressed um, uh, our expressions of ourselves on the digital systems of the world. Um, I mean, the, and you know, uh, one of the, in terms of open source software, one of the things sad, one of the things that makes me a little sad, is that you see a lot less younger people coming to open source conferences. I mean, to a certain degree, 
because now they're all very professionalized. You know, it costs you, you know, a grand or maybe half a grand or maybe three grand to go and visit one of these open source conferences now, which used to be free and run as hobbyist projects by IELTS guys. Um, and even if you're a student, you're still going to pay 100 or 300 pounds, which you know, limits who can, who can go and who can be involved. Um, and I think that's probably possibly why we see a lot more movement in the maker space because that's ne that is very much a hobbyist space and is easier and it's you know something you can be involved with um, without without that professionalization. Um, and there's some software areas where it's still hobbyist, but if you look at the main core pieces of infrastructure, it's very much professionalized now. Um, but you know. Uh, so the maker maker community, I think. So there's some of the problems that I think are still there. Um, in terms of where where next, where I th I see things moving next for open source, I, I think peer production is an inevitable force. Uh, I used to say in, in the very early days that open source would win because it was a uh, behavioral and legal structure which allowed competing and disinterested entities to work together effectively and I think that that very much still holds true uh, and so as we end up with increasing complexity and increasing uh, base functionality levels and what we need to deliver out into the marketplace it gets to the point where no one organization unless it's sunk a lot of costs already um, no one organization can afford to get out there. And I've started to see this happen in, in the digital design areas, which is why I'm, I'm currently uh, putting together a startup around doing open source silicate design, uh, which is quite a new and exciting area. And in some ways, feels very much like those, for me, those early days of people being very excited about being able to create. Um, so I think, you know, if you want to look where, where, where the next exciting stuff is, look for where people are young and excited feeling very excited about what they're able to create because that's where the non-linear value will come from. Um, so I think it was a bit of a rambling talk. I hope everyone enjoyed it a little. Uh, it was a bit, uh, I've, has anyone got any questions? <laughs>